Welcome to yet another episode of On the Bookshelf with me, Neil De Silva. And today I have for you a hugely popular author of contemporary Indian literature, that is Kiran Mandral, a veteran of nine books. She started in 2011 with her first title, The Reluctant Detective, which was put out by Westland. But and she has, uh, you know, gone across various genres. Uh, she has written romance and chiclet. Her titles there are uh, Once Upon a Crush, All Aboard, Saving Maya. And then she went on to horror with The Face at the Window. She has also written a psychological thriller, Missing Presumed Dead, which did quite well recently. And then she also went on to non-fiction titles. Her non-fiction titles are Karmic Kids, A Boy's Guide to Growing Up, True Love Stories, and uh, a mega bestseller, The Thirteen Steps to Bloody Good Parenting, which she co-authored with Ashwin Sanghi. Along with that, Kiran is very prolific in writing short stories, and her stories have been published with Juggernaut and in magazines such as Verve and Cosmopolitan. She has also been part of anthologies such as uh, Boo, which was put out by Penguin, and uh, another anthology titled uh, City of Screams, which was published by Half Baked Beans, and uh, which I had the honor to curate and edit. So uh, apart from that, Kiran, yes, she has been multi-awarded. So one of her biggest achievements was in 2018 when she won the International Women's Day Award for excellence in the field of writing, and this was uh, by none other than the Indian Council of UN Relations, supported by the Ministry of Women and Child Development of the Government of India. So here we have the super talented Kiran Mandral, and uh, hello, Kiran, how are you today? Hi. All well, Neil. That was a very long introduction. All was needed was Kiran Mandral <laughs> writes books. I think that's more than. Yeah. So you started in 2011, and that was with, uh, uh, you know, your early books were more of romance. So we had Saving Maya, we had All Aboard, which was with Penguin, I suppose, and then uh, there was also a title known as Once Upon a Crush. So at that time, I think romance was doing quite well in India. It was quite a popular genre, and you were also writing romance. So how was your romance or your definition of love different from the love stories at that time, which were going around? <laughs> I think I'm a very cynical romance writer. So even if you see uh, all about it's about a girl who is jilted basically at the very last minute by her fiance and goes on a cruise where she finds love again. Mm. Once upon a crush is about a girl whose parents are hassling her to get married, and she has a crush on a most unsuitable kid. Character from her office. Even Saving Maya is a second chance romance. It's about one who is divorced and you know who finds love again. And with all these books, I do not believe in the happily ever after. It is the happily mm. right now that I talk about. You know, grab happiness while you can. I think that's my philosophy when it comes to uh, everything, and it sort of reflects in the way I write romance. And uh, at that point, I think romance was very fun, and it was a nice uh, way of writing. But mm. as you know, you are a writer yourself. You know, you contain mm. multitudes, so there's always many other things that one wants to express. Yes, <laughs> so many ideas. But then uh, that is one thing about you that I admire because you have not stuck to a genre. You have uh, like tried out uh, a lot of things. It's like a buffet. So what <laughs> happens? So how does it? Uh, so that means you give precedence to the story rather than the genre. So you are not, uh, you know, some authors like even me for right now. I'm just chasing horror because that is where you know I've got some following. But you have uh, moved on and you have gone to other genres and you have tried out. So how does that happen? How does the story idea come to you? And how do you know that okay, this is a story that I have to develop and write it and bring it out? How do you do that? What's the process? It generally begins with the character, Neil. Never the story; it's the person. So mm. it depends on you know how the person, what kind of a person comes to my head. So sometimes it might be somebody who's really sad, uh, like my protagonist in All Aboard, mm. for instance, or it might be somebody who is uh, on the uh, on the cusp of uh, her thirties and desperate to you know settle down as society is pressurizing her like Reena Day and all about once upon a crush or like Mrs McNally she's a seventy yeah. eight year old Anglo Indian retired school teacher and mm. her story so the story the character defines how the story will turn out for me okay so do you derive these characters from your real life experiences people you know observe how 
or uh, are they just uh, you know in your mind uh for me i think it's a composite of both real life as well as imaginary so mm. it might be like for instance mrs mcnally might be remnants of a person my mother told me about while she was teaching at convent and jesus okay. and very it masuri so you know uh, so many single uh, unmarried anglo indian uh, teachers that they, uh, they had with them mm. so maybe it's a composite of those uh, all with their little quirks and little uh, you know lack of back stories or uh, curiosity value attached to them at that point okay so uh, maybe that uh, and even missing presumed dead uh, incident that happened when i was very young about uh, a, i was small i think four or five and somebody Mm. just went away and never came back leaving her two kids behind in the okay. area and that sort of stuck in my head i think i revisited it after many years so it's always composites it might not be true to the original but mm. somehow something is taken yeah. from real life you know how it works you know we cannibalize yes. everything the writers our job is to cannibalize the world around us <laughs> so yeah and writing characters is always fun and you know one thing that i believe is that uh, our readers they may or may not remember the story but they will remember the characters and uh, we have seen that in literature uh, also in our movies especially like you know people will remember gabbar singh very well but they may not know what is the story of the movie shole so it's like that so characters i believe that uh, if an author has a pulse of the character then you know that is ha- more than half the job well done the plot builds around it Absolutely. Uh so those were your influences then that's uh, the various places that you came from and you developed your stories but then there is also something that you pursued a career in your early days which was journalism and you were quite the journalist you know with big publications to your uh, credit so from journalism when you made the move to writing books we believe that you know it's it's said that for a journalist the Uh, end goal is always to write a book and become an author it is because most journalists do that but you went uh, one step ahead or you, i should say many steps ahead not only did you become an author but you con- stayed consistent with it and now it is like a decade that you are writing how did journalism influence your writing and did journalism open roads for you like you know did it get you good publishers and uh, you know just tell me how about how it went Neil, I quit journalism in ten uh, years before I wrote my first book. Mm. I quit to have my baby, and I stayed a schoolgate mom. So I had completely dropped out of the journalistic space. So okay. did it help me? No, it didn't help me. What helped me was a dear friend, Parul Sharma, introducing okay. me to her editor and uh, being on my case to write my book, and that's how I wrote it. Mm. Uh, but what I did do, Neil, was I blogged. Hmm. So I was among India's uh, most popular bloggers for a long time. My book, okay. my blog, Karmic Kids, and my uh, which was about parenting, and my other was one of the most popular blogs on parenting in India for the longest hmm. time. I think for years and years until I shut it down. That's hmm. even become a thesis now in on empowered okay. motherhood in the early 2000s. Uh, then there was 36 and counting, which was also a very popular blog. So I treated my blogs as a kind of riyas, everyday mm-hmm. writing mm-hmm. practice. how did journalism help me in writing i think uh, it just gives you the discipline to be able to write which is very important because i think many times we as uh, you know creative people get trapped into do a, a mire of i'm not inspired today i don't want to write i don't feel mm. it the words are not coming in journalism you don't have to be inspired yeah. you can't do that and you just have to sit down and produce your words and your article and do the research and get things done so i think that discipline was very important uh, it's a good training ground to be able to write amidst distractions especially in these times when you know everybody's at home <laughs> life is going to go around you so the ability to be able to write in the midst of chaos is i think something that journalism has given me and also the ability to multitask so i can be hmm. working on three or four different things at the same time so i'll be yeah doing a draft of one i will be doing the revisions of another i will be checking the line uh, uh, edits of another i can be doing a skeleton of another so it's it's an uh, i think journalism has really been a good training ground of sorts even though i was out of it for a pretty long time hmm so what kind of journalism did you do um across the board actually neil when i was at asian age i covered advertising i had an advertising column called the medium and the message back then mm-hmm. 
I also covered business. I covered art, films, uh, gender issues. Okay. At the Saturday Times, it was more culture and uh, women gender issues. Uh, not Saturday Times, Sunday Review. Yeah. Um, so I did that at Cosmopolitan. You, Cosmopolitan. I don't need to elaborate further. It was twenty ways to seduce a man and how to mm. look good. So publication combinations mm. of those. So uh, that was uh, basically what I did, and I did a short stint at DSG Television. So that was very okay. short, uh, not too long. The channel never really took off, but it gave me some sort of uh, background as to the chaos of television, and I realized that you know it's not meant for me. It was also for a few years uh, consulting with the Shida people, overseeing their content and their events. So that was another bit of my journalistic mm-hmm. journey. But that came after a break of around ten years. So I think journalism opens up the mind. You come across a lot of stories, and somehow it shapes you. And the kind of uh, stories that you wrote, obviously, you know, it required a lot of uh, in-depth research. So uh, that's what I need to talk about next. Like uh, even with uh, your books, like Saving Maya, or also you know the horror book, uh, The Face at the Window, you have tackled a couple of uh, issues. Like you know, there were mental issues, and then you are talking about uh, dysfunctional marriages. so you know these are considered to be uh, you know very sensitive subjects which many authors will not take up because one thing is that they might not be attuned to write such a thing and second thing is the readership might not be there so do you self censor do you feel like okay this is somewhere this is something that i should not uh, cross the line do you do you do that do you draw the line somewhere I don't think I really a self censor. Uh, what I'm not comfortable about writing, I will not write. Like I'm not comfortable about writing, writing mm. sex. So I can't write that. It's mm. like uh, that's the only thing I think I self censor because I'm very acutely conscious of the fact that I have a teenage son, and I don't want him being put in an unpleasant spot amongst his peers okay. because his mother writes uh, <laughs> anything too salacious. that's mm-hmm. the only self censoring that i do but apart from that i think i pretty much write whatever i feel the story needs however yeah. disturbing it may be however gritty it may be however uh, unpleasant it may be uh, for instance in missing presumed that the marriage was very dysfunctional and yes. it's not a not a very pleasant it's not a very pleasant read it's a very disturbing read but i think we uh, as writers we need to place the disturbing out there because it needs to shake up the reader it needs to hold a mirror to what really happens mm. and if you there is writing for escapism and there is writing to cath- to provide catharsis yeah. so you choose what you want to write so my escapism is uh, i think all aboard and once upon a crush my catharsis mm. is missing seems there at the face of the window so <laughs> it's a cross so it is interesting that you call it a catharsis because you know most authors won't say that and writing dark stuff is you know something that they would not believe as something that is probably healing okay uh, one thing that i would like to know from you because you have been writing since 10 years now so how has the scene changed how has literature changed from that time to now has there been any change and even about the readership um i don't think 10 years is long enough a span to really decide about how readership has changed or literature has changed because literature trends really take a long time i think uh, mm. you need to be very honest uh, i see a lot of people changing what is uh, chasing what is trendy to write so for a long time it was chetan bhagat and his lad like books and there was a whole genre of books that came out in a similar way and of course amish with his wonderful mythologies and you know super success of his mythology yeah. and the whole mythology gen- genre became uh, myth of fantasy became really popular and really so uh, i see that happening but on the other side i also see some really good writing coming out and uh, for instance shubangi swarup's uh, book uh, latitudes of longing i mean lovely book and mm. uh, Amrita Mahale is milk teed. So there's a yeah. lot of interesting writing that's also coming out, and from debut authors. So that's really encouraging. I what I find interesting is that we are now seeing Indian authors putting out their stories genuinely without really uh, you know shaping them for the white gaze. That is uh, something that I find very encouraging because we're telling our stories, and uh, very often I don't see the Indian words italicized in the text, and I think yes. yeah. That's how it should be. Let them take the effort to find out what it means. 
and uh, i i came across that when my own books were getting edited so i asked my commissioning editors like you know we used to do this now and so the editors said that no now we don't do that anymore so if Absolutely. it's a Indian word we are keeping it as it is we don't italicize it so that's a very positive sign like we are writing for the indian market now so that's probably a bigger change and i think that was assured in by chetan bhagat more than his predecessors because they still had that colonial hangover kind of thing so uh, that's nice and we have also headed in a better direction probably after this because uh, all these things which are you know even the pandemic that we have we are facing new experiences so obviously a lot of more books will come out uh and now talking about something that uh, has always you know intrigued me about you like you wrote romance and uh, stuff like that you know like soft kind of literature and then suddenly you came up with a horror title <laughs> so that was uh, so i i did not expect like kiran would write a horror title and so how did uh, that happen uh, why did you feel that that story had to be horror because i'm sure the story must have come to you first you know i'm a uh, i'm a person who loves pg woodhouse and mm. uh, stephen king in equal measure okay so i think it's only natural that my writing should reflect that i can go from a murakami to a, a tolkien to uh, you know a very light and funny uh, mark twain so it it's one's reading has been across the spectrum so i think it's only natural that one's writing also should be across the spectrum why confine yourself if a story demands horror mm. that's nice let it be let's don't censor yourself and say i am only a romance writer i'm mm. only going to write romance also i think i'm very easily bored neil i think that's my yeah. flaw so to speak and it's very annoying for my publishers because you know i'm not very easily bracketed into she writes this or she writes mm. that she writes that and uh, my uh, editor at uh, amaralis calls me genre bending which is a very kind of <laughs> but i i understand it makes it difficult for them to market me but uh, so far so good <laughs> but it's a good thing you know because you are writing the stories that you totally believe in and then you don't want to bend them in a particular way just because you know you have got a previous reputation to uphold you are just writing the story as it demands so that is quite uh, an appreciable thing and i don't find that in many authors you know like on the scene today i mean apart from you there may be i could probably think of kulpreet yadav who is doing that who is moving on with genres but then that's not happening much so very good and keep up uh, maybe we don't know what you will be coming up with next so that is also a part of the you know fun i don't know what i'll be coming up with next <laughs> so something that you surprised us with last year last year i think it was was this book 13 uh, steps to bloody good parenting and that was with ashwin sanghi was it last year it was last year 2019 yeah yeah it seems like a lifetime away with this pandemic <laughs> <laughs> so you co-wrote it with ashwin sanghi and uh, co-writing has always been a kind of mixed experience for authors so how was yours and because both of you have such strong voices you as well as ashwin sanghi so how did that happen how did that resonance happen between the two of you and you got that book out see ashwin has been a dear friend for the longest of times in okay. fact uh, uh, i knew him from before my first book came out and when his first uh, book which was the rosebell line was out we connected on twitter and i was very impressed with how he took sean higgins to ashwin sanghi and and uh, when my uh, second book was not happening and once upon a crash kept getting rejected left right and center he was i had almost given up you know writing i thought maybe it's not for me he was the one who was sort of push me said no you just get it out don't bother So okay. he's been a very strong supporter, always. He came to me and said that uh, there's um, the series that I'm doing, 13 Steps to Bloody Good, Marx, Health, Wealth, mm. Luck, and I want to do parenting okay. with you. And I, uh, very honestly, I was. Uh, I don't think I give parenting advice. I don't see Ashwin. It's not advice that I give in. my all my parenting writings it's just been anecdotes mm. this is that's just what we want we don't want to be sitting on any soap box and saying this is how you should parent we just want to put out to you uh, things that are universal that everybody knows but maybe we just need to be reminded a bit about it it's very it was a 
an easy process because the guidelines were in place. Ashwin has very uh, proper guidelines and it makes it easy for you to structure it. And he's a wonderful person to work with. It was a very fluid process because, you know, you did the drafts and it went back and forth a couple of times mm -hmm. and little changes. But uh, I don't think we uh, there was any overpowering of voices from either side. Okay. It was a very fluid process and it's it's rare to get that kind of camaraderie when yes, you're working. Yes, it's very rare. Yeah. And because I've always been very wary about uh, co-authoring anything because of that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's come back to uh, your short stories because you have written so many of them and uh, in anthologies, I think you, I, I don't know, I don't even have a count of the number of anthologies that you are in <laughs> and also the short stories in magazines and everything. So how does a short story uh, come to you, occur to you and uh, do you feel like short stories are better to write than novels? I don't know. I came to short stories after I had published my first novel. So it was a relearning for me, so to speak. And I only ever wrote short stories when they'd been commissioned to me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it was a uh, very specific, write a short story and this is the topic or whatever, whatever. There were some short stories I wrote for pleasure, like Switcheroo, which is on the Juggernaut app. And that's yeah. very experimental. It's very surreal. And like, you know, horror people are very surprised that I wrote horror. People were very surprised that I wrote surreal, uh, mat uh, realism. So I think my short stories are a space for me to experiment. They're a space yeah. for me to have fun and, you know, not bother <clears throat> too much about uh, because they're so much more compressed than a novel is. So it's a small investment of my time, but it's uh, so much joy in terms of, you know, playing around with characters, mood spaces. Even the short story I did for Boo, which is actually the... Pr it could be the precursor, the prologue to uh, the face at the window. It's where it all mm. begins. So the boo short story is where the face at the window begins okay. from. So, you know, the backstory as to why all that happened in the entire novel, mm. that is in boo. And uh, for Magical Women, for the Magical Women anthology, it was a feminist anthology in, mm. based on fantasy. And that was very challenging. So it was. A, it's always been like taking up a challenge and doing something within the confines of... Uh, 3,000 to 10,000 words. Yeah, even your short story in uh, City of Screams, the anthology that we did together, that yep. was also much appreciated. Quite a different story from the rest of the stories that were in the collection. So that that was a good read and uh, people are still commenting, you know, like this is one story that stands out. So you have also written fiction, you have also written non-fiction, you have written the stuff that is very commercial and you have also written stuff that is, you know, bordering on literary. So how do you, uh, you know, differentiate between fiction and non-fiction? The challenges of writing both are very different, Neil, as you know. Um, you've done scripts and you've been writing. So each medium has a different challenge for fiction. I think the challenge is more to get your imagination into overdrive. For non-fiction, it is to stay true to the facts and to, you know, uh, make sure that you are not embellishing on the facts or you're not, you know, uh, layering on too much on the facts and let the facts present themselves as they are. For me, uh, I find non-fiction non more challenging than fiction because by mm. God, you have to make sure that everything is absolutely accurate and you know yeah. everything is in place and you're not to like, you know, got any fact wrong. So for me, no non-fiction gives me a lot of stress. Fiction is like completely cool. <laughs> so that's my personal challenge. And you were speaking about, uh, yeah, the layers in my writing yes i i'm glad you brought that up because you know very often uh, the readers get very annoyed because i don't like to present everything in black and white especially in my books like missing presumed dead and the face of the window and the forthcoming book uh, which will should be out in a couple of months september october hopefully uh, i don't like to present everything in black and white i want the reader to work i want the reader to find different meanings each time he or she reads the book and it should be like, what if this has happened? But perhaps this could have also happened. What mm. could have happened? What is it? I mean, I find it very lazy when, you know, everything is explained. This happened, this happened, this happened. Where does the reader use his or her imagination? There has to be more to make the story haunt you. And that's what I try to do. And even a simple totally. book like a chiclet, I mean, mm. I will give it layers. Like, for instance, Once Upon a Crush is a comment on you know societal pressures to get married by 30 
and then defying those pressures, getting almost settled and defying it. So I try to have a subtext to everything. Even a book like Reluctant Detective will be about how women draw. It's on the face of it a bored housewife, but beyond that, it's how women, professionally qualified women, are dropping out of the workforce because mm. of lack of childcare. So I hope readers get it. Yeah, they, some of them do, and uh, you know that <laughs> is the fun of reading because when you read several times, you know there's always something else emerging, and I think that is the best way to read and enjoy something. Something that when the author is like spoon feeding you everything, I don't think that is a uh, good fun. That is okay. That is you know popcorn entertainment kind of thing. But then there is that kind of writing which you do, which is more cerebral, and uh, I should say that more fruitful to a person who wants to read it. They derive more out of it. Uh, let us come to your uh, social media profiles because I have seen you are very, very active, and this is something that all writers, you know, especially now, every writer wants to be. Totally visible on social media, every platform that they want to be on. So you are very active on Twitter. I have noticed more than on the other platforms. You are very open when you are voicing out your opinion. So how do you uh, look at your Twitter profile yourself? In you know a third dimension, if we talk about how do you look at it? And uh, secondly, any tips for writers who would like to you know uh, become visible on Twitter or any other social platform? Because many writers just make mistakes when they are there on social media. I uh, about me being on Twitter. I think that's the medium. As a writer, it's a lovely medium because you use words. I'm not so good at Instagram because I can't think visually, and I can't be. I can't be. I can't even remember that I need to click a photograph and put it up, and I'm horrible at selfie. So Instagram is not the medium for me. Twitter is the medium that works for me because, as you say. I put too much of my opinions out, which is, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to be honest. But uh, I think if you are a writer and a creative person, you have an obligation to voice what you feel, and it's you cannot be neutral or not have mm. an opinion, because that, in that you are doing a disservice to yourself as a creative person. Yeah. As a person who is uh, somebody others might be reading, you uh, you know you can play safe and you can not have an opinion. And I tried three days of not having an opinion and I couldn't bear it. And I went mm. right back to having an opinion and very strongly indeed. <laughs> But I have realized that the best you can do is to register what you dislike or register what you have an opinion about and let it be. Twitter mm. is like a huge. Huge hall of different people from different places, from different voices, different opinions, and not everybody will like what you have to say. So mm. if you want to play it safe, don't be on Twitter. Be on a Facebook and Insta. Or, you know, more. I mean, there are trolls everywhere, of course. Don't have yeah. an opinion. Go out there and put your uh, stuff about the books and things like that. But what I feel is important is to be authentic, to be responsive, to have conversations. To talk about the issues that matter, to call out things that you think aren't uh, mm. aren't right, that's very important. I think for every thinking person in the country, not just writers, and to also to not just come to Twitter to talk about your books. I see many people just coming and saying, "This is my book. This is released. This is out, and you can buy mm. it here." Who cares? Nobody cares. That doesn't work. Yeah. Twitter does not sell your books. Nobody will buy your books because you put it out on Twitter. Nobody will buy your books because you know somebody retweeted your tweet about mm. your books. I do that a lot. I retweet uh, tweets about books and I retweet and I try to amplify anything. But at the most, it will get people curious. People will buy mm. only on word of mouth. At the most, it will make people aware that your book is out. Yeah. What you need to do is to build up an authentic presence, have conversations, have people there know what you stand for and what you represent. And be able to take the heat because if uh, you're in yes. the kitchen, you will get the heat. Yes. So. <laughs> so I was going to ask you about that. How do you handle trolling? Because somebody who is so opinionative is obviously going to get a backlash as well. Uh, so what do you do about that? Do you respond to them? Do you ignore them? What do you do? Earlier I would respond and I would get very flummoxed. Now I don't bother. <laughs> See, I have my opinion. They have their opinion. 
I may not agree with their opinion. They will not agree with my opinion. If somebody is polite, I will try and respond and engage and have a conversation. If somebody is being needlessly rude, I've got a teenage son at home. I've got all the rudeness I need right here. Mm-hmm. Why would I take it from Twitter? So, <laughs> uh, I don't respond. And I set my uh, now for my own sanity. I think uh, mental health is a very important issue. I have set my notifications unlimited, so I okay. don't see everything that comes my way, which is a blessing. I think, and I'm not curious. It might some people might think I'm being rude when I don't respond, but I genuinely don't see them if they are not following me. I don't see their tweets to me. Mm-hmm. But it filters out well, a lot of the chat. Uh, yeah, I think that is necessary because when you are on social media and we when you get such kind of acidic comments, I think it does throw you off gear for a while. You know, however you say that, okay, I am not affected, but I do think that happens. and maybe that is the reason why a lot of writers you know they our people in general don't voice their opinions it's not that everybody will love you everywhere some mm. people will like you the way you are some people will dislike you for no rhyme or reason you can't you know sort of sit up sobbing why does that person hate me i never did anything to that person it doesn't work that way so just go with the flow and be authentic to what you believe in and that's the only way to be on twitter or any social media i think okay So let's have a last question because I see that we are running out of time. So uh, tell me about uh, your publishers because you have got so many of them. Who is your favorite publisher? To be quite upfront, do you have favorites or do you not want to mention? It's not that one has favorites with publishers. Publishers are all lovely. They all want to get their books selling and they all are very uh, proactive uh, or not proactive as the case may be. I think what one I go for is the editor. So there is. Uh, I worked with wonderful editor who gave me my first chance. That's Titi Talwar at Westland, Amazon Westland. Mm. So I adore her for the fact that she took a chance on a complete unknown at that point and got the reluctant detective out. I uh, another editor I really enjoyed working with was Vaishali Mathur of uh, Penguin, mm. a random mouse. and uh, she did all about with me and uh, she was very nurturing and very caring and i loved the way she handled me throughout the process okay and also uh, i'm working with some wonderful editors right now uh, there's uh, prerna gill at harper there's uh, saswati at uh, rupa there's uh, there's so many uh, the one who's closest to my heart and uh, everyone else please don't mm-hmm. hate me is rashmi man okay and a family <laughs> is uh, done now uh, missing presumed dead and the face of the wind one now the forthcoming more things in heaven and earth she is a dream editor to work with because she is so nurturing and she is so involved with your manuscript she is emotionally invested in your book so even uh, you know amrilis is a boutique public publishing house it's a literary mm. arm of manjul which is very big in hindi publishing and language publishing and amrilis is the literary arm of the english publishing division but uh, Rashmi really brings her everything to your book, and I find that very, uh, very gratifying as a writer to find an uh, editor who invests herself in your work. So. I think that really makes a better book. And uh, so I had the pleasure of working with Shashwati at Rupa. So I just came to know that you have also worked with her. So that's yeah. quite a good experience. We'll we'll work with her because I'm in the process of writing that. Acha, book. Okay, that is still going on. So then, that was a wonderful chat, Kiran. Any parting tips for our writers who are li- who may be listening? Parting tips, Neil. As I always say, please read, please read, please read. I don't think people are reading enough. Read thousand pages to write one paragraph. So <laughs> your reading should be completely. So you have given a proper mathematical equation there. Thousand yeah. pages to one paragraph. I hear people saying, you know, I don't read because I don't want it to influence my style. please get off that high horse to so read widely read across genres across authors it will not influence your style it will only enrich the tools of your trade that is words uh, that is actually the thing that people should do but then i am shocked at how many people won't read a single book and then there was a guy who challenged me that i will never read a, he has never read and he said that i will not read a book but i will write a book and become a published author and show you so he never got back to me in the last 7 years <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that happens so thank you very much kiran i think we had a very fun and interesting chat and uh, quite a 
bit of you know nuggets of information also coming from you thank you so much i hope you enjoyed it thank you absolutely thank you so much neel for having me great to be on your show thanks for always being so supportive of my work and inviting me to your to lit venture and to skecon and to all the events that you do and also inviting me to write for city of dreams pleasure always thanks neel thank you so much thank you